Today is February 9, 2016. My name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing David Wilson in the Oklahoma Conference Ministry Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The interview, uh, this interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and in the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. It will also be available on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Uh, David, uh, thanks for taking time mm -hmm. for this follow-up interview mm -hmm. with you. Um, I wanted to start with the, the mission uh, <coughs> following the, the uh, Civil War and then in that period. Uh, you know, following the Civil War, new uh, <coughs> Indian Missionary uh, uh, Conference Superintendent John Harrell attempted to impose control over the Native American churches and strict adherence to Methodist theology and liturgy. Can you explain how local churches leverage the power of the uh, of tribal leaders to help them maintain control of the local, uh, the local churches? The leverage that the tribes helped with after the, after the Civil War was um, very important, especially among uh, the five tribes. You know, his, history calls us the five civilized tribes, but today we call, them, uh, call ourselves the five tribes. And a big piece of that was, uh, was that the um, tribes, of course, the tribes had a big say in, you know, I guess you could say, the religious aspects of our lives not just the church, the nominations, Presbyterians, Baptists, and Methodists who were evangelizing, but also the ceremonial people. And often uh, from our reading in history, we see that many of the early tribal leaders were also Methodists. And of course, later some of the chiefs were even Methodists as they were uh, today. So I, I, from my reading and from our accounts, that from the few sources we have, say, uh, remind us that the tribes had great leverage in terms of uh, having, in terms of trusting uh, denominations to come in and uh, uh, evangelize among the people. Of course, that started early before removal, but that was also very, they played an important role uh, once the tribes were removed here in Indian Territory, especially among the Creeks, uh, Muscogee Creeks, Cherokees, and Choctaws and Chickasaws. Yeah. David, uh, picking up on your, your comments there, fast forwarding to the uh when the, the tribes lost their sovereignty mm -hmm. uh, in statehood and period mm -hmm. and land run. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the, the reasons why they were so devastated during that period when they lost their tribal uh, leadership and government mm -hmm. and didn't have the tribes to help support the local yeah. churches? Was that important? I, I think what was important for once Oklahoma became a state, uh, you know, his, historians tell us there were, of course, the, uh, there could have been as well as many as 200 uh, Indian Methodist churches across the eastern part of the state. Because remember, they had not uh, progressed to the northern or to the western side of the state. And one of the things I tell people is that whenever the Oklahoma Conference formed uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to create its own annual conference, there was no uh, conversation and no uh, dialogue between the Indian Mission at the time. It just happened. And, and, and what, what happened too, if you, you can imagine uh, the tribes and a huge number of the people at that time would have spoken their tribal languages. And at that time, I, I imagine a good percentage of the services were done in the language, especially the hymns, preaching, script, even scriptures and everything. So you can imagine once that happened to become merged, if you will, into the Oklahoma Conference, predominantly white conference, that many, many, many of our churches, we're not exactly sure what happened. Uh, uh, there's not a lot of, lot of documentation that says, but speculation is that Many became independent uh, churches, and others uh, later, uh, around the Civil War, uh, perhaps were converted to uh, Baptist churches. And those are from oral tradition from folk who are no longer, uh, no longer uh, with us uh, with us today. But that was a turning point. You know, today we have about I think maybe five churches in the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, around Stayhead, there would have been as many, uh, well over 100 churches. And so we often are perplexed about how that came to be. Now, th now there also were uh, some churches that are in the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation that be became uh, churches in the Oklahoma Annual Conference. One of those churches we, we received back from the Oklahoma Conference maybe 10 years ago, the little church called Bryan Chapel near, near uh, Prior, Oklahoma, that when I looked at the deeds, that originally was a church deeded by the, uh, land deeded by the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and then somehow became uh, 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 came to be become a uh, part of the Oklahoma Annual Conference, which is very interesting when you look at those old deeds. David, in the struggle for control uh, between the church <coughs> and, and the Native American uh, uh, Methodists, 
you mentioned uh, languages, and how important with use of the Native American preachers, tribal languages, <coughs> and interpreters in controlling the, the message of the mission? I, I, you know, early, early on, you know, early on interpreters were very, very important to the life of the Indian Methodist Church. I think early on uh, uh, removal, uh, a person like John Page, who was a full-blooded Choctaw, very educated, and he, he would be the one who would be the interpreter for the annual conference and other ga gatherings. And I think there's even a marker dedicated to his life near Pecola, Oklahoma, where he would have uh, came from. So that was very, very important. There's a wonderful story that, um, uh, that, that some of the tribes in the West tell, and every time you hear it, it's a different translation. But that was very important for the five tribes, but especially as you uh, went into western Oklahoma uh, around the time of J.J. Methvin when he was uh, present in the area. But a, a story of one of the um, uh, white evangelists who came and had a three-night camp meeting with the Kiowa churches, and first night he didn't have much of a response. Uh, through the interpreter, the second night not much of a response, but the third night had a great response, and people came in droves uh, to the altar to uh, to pray and to repent and so forth. And and the the preacher was baffled about why that was, and the interpreter the interpreter said the first two nights you didn't do very very well, so the third night I used my own my own language, I used my own words, my own subject, and that's what happened. And, and it's, I still hear that story today as I travel in, among the Kiowas. Although the stories change and the person change who they name, but it's a wonderful example of the power of interpreters for how they how they help with the gospel. And uh, can you mention some of the uh, Native American preachers in the uh, Indian Missionary Conference who were influential in restoring the uh, ministry after the devastation of Civil War? Some of the pastors that I, from what I've read and heard from oral tradition, some of these are listed, of course, in our, our journals in archives and history. The, the greatest, of course, would have been Samuel Shikoti, who, who, whose ministry began upon removal. He was a young boy, and it's a wonderful uh, story about his uh, tenacity as a, as a uh, Christian. But later, whenever uh, Samuel Shikoti, uh, as he, as he uh, grew, he soon later was elected chief of the Muscogee Creek Nation, which is what they're called today. And one of the very first things he did was to work with the legislature, the Creek legislature, uh, to um, uh, uh, to uh, accept Christianity, translate the New Testament into Muscogee Creek language. And so he, he, from that point, continued on. And even during the Civil War, uh, around the Civil War, uh, you'll see that, that there are many of our pastors who joined uh, the Army uh, to fight for what was now you know, our home in Indian Territory. And it was many of those pastors, not a ho huge number because many did, uh, join, uh, join the military, but they were. There's a handful who kept ministry alive, although um, uh, churches were burnt, destroyed, uh, all sorts of calamities happening. It was many of the uh, clergy and the laypersons who helped keep those churches uh, alive. How would you summarize the effectiveness of mission uh, in the Indian Territory following the Civil War? You know, they were <coughs> just about ceased, had to rebuild it. How? How uh, effective was mission work uh, after that? And so what was the growth of Native Americanism uh, in that era? Mission work after Civil War uh, struggled, again, because of uh, all the devastation that the war caused. And, and, and Homer Nolley spoke the first, first white frost. He shares examples of a two, I think it's a Choctaw on the creek, who would still go up from church to church and assemble what laypersons they could to keep the skeleton of, of the church alive, if you will, so people could continue to meet uh, and worship and do what they could uh, uh, through those times. And, and, and of course, after the Civil War and the churches began to rebuild and the people picked up where they left off at. And But you also have to remember, even after the Civil War, that for the tribes who fought for the North or for the, uh, I mean, whatever side they fought for, uh, that after it was over, whoever lost, there were still repercussions, repercussions to pay from the government. So for instance, uh, Cherokees uh, lost some land, Creeks would have lost some land, and so that also affected how we did ministry in the area that was no longer yours, that became either property of the government and sometimes given to other tribes, which is very uh, uh, interesting when we stop and look at that. Well, following the, uh, the <coughs> treaties, the, following the uh, treaties of the uh, Five so lots drive with the uh, federal government after the mm -hmm. Civil War. They gave up their lands in, in western uh, Oklahoma. 
the uh, then the Medicine Lodge Treaty in 1867 <coughs> forced the Plains Indians, uh, that are talking about the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache, <coughs> from the tribal domains onto reservations in that mm -hmm. Western Territory in Oklahoma. Uh, in 1886, Bishop Galloway directed the IMC to start missionary work with the Indians. Can you talk about some of the missions, starting with J.J. Uh, Methman mm -hmm. and the success of his mission to the five, well, say the five tribes, primarily Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache? J.J. Methvin, uh, my understanding, uh, you know, many of, our, many of our stories are stories passed down from oral tradition, what we read, and J.J. Methvin was one of the early pastors um, who appealed to either to his bishop or to the church, General Conference, I forget which it was, and said someone needs to go, quote unquote, to the wild tribes in the western part of Indian Territory to evangelize. And the bishop uh, turned around, story says, and appointed J.J. Methvin, who did it. He took up shop, went without his family, and set up tents uh, along the banks, I believe, of the, of the river in Cairo country and began his ministry. And of course, he struggled early on. Uh, people, you can imagine the struggle of the Kiowas, uh, of, of these tribes, the Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches, all the broken treaties that the government had with them uh, from the lands which they come from, and the huge struggle they had, much more than the five tribes in the eastern part of the state. And so their distrust of uh, this denomination, which was run predominantly by uh, Anglo folk, uh, that, that distrust was very much there. And there's, one, there's stories of uh, the struggles he had with trying to help folks understand, uh, uh, understand what he was about. One of the conversion stories of Kicking Bird, who was, I, I believe, the very first Cairo ordained as a deacon, perhaps in 1905. He came out of the Mount Scott uh, Cairo Church and the Kicking Bird tells a story. Well, early on, the story is told of J.J. Methvin has set up a, tent, a camp meeting uh, near uh, Anadarko, I, be, I believe, near, near the river. And uh, Kicking Bird and some others had uh, come to confront him, to run him out of town. You know, they were, you know, the, the, at that time, some of the tribes had their own religions, and they were so mad at the government for what the government had done, and you could not separate the government from the church and uh, had a confrontation with J.J. Methvin, and J.J. Methvin uh, quoted in the book and said, I I'm not preaching uh, the white man's religion, I'm preaching, the, I'm preaching the Jesus religion. And something he said stuck, because Kickenberg stuck around, listened, and converted uh, to Christianity, and of course many of the people there converted. And, and even today, although most of them are gone, in the last 10, 15 years, when I would uh, visit with some of the elders from Kiowa country or of Comanche country, they spoke very highly of J.J. Methvin. Many who, who went to school at the Methvin Institute and uh, talked about, um, for certain, you know, for liking him, I think for the reason that he uh, did not do as some of the earliest missionaries in terms of uh, seeking to abolish language and culture, but he had to find ways to work within that to be successful among the folk. And there are a handful of people, uh, Bud Simont, who, who uh, we know well, his family, his sisters would have been uh, persons in that school and, and who knew him, which is always fascinating, fascinating to think about uh, how, how we're not as far removed generation-wise to our history as people believe we are. <clears throat> David, you, you're picking up on your comments about J.J. Methvin and, and uh, his uh, Methvin Institute or school mm -hmm. located in Andarco. He, he worked for more than, his work was distinguished for its effectiveness and the length of uh, the you know, mm -hmm. years in ministry. But can you explain how his approach to mission work, and you reciting some of that, was different and why it was so successful? Uh, and I'm thinking, David, particularly about the manner in which he honored the spiritual heritage of the, uh, you know, the Native American people at the same time that he evangelized for Christ. I think Methvin was successful, uh, at least from what, what I have been able to read, and again, listening to people who, who uh, speak very highly of him and what he did. Uh, two things, you know, in, in his school, in the early, earliest boarding schools, uh, the uh, government and the churches sought to uh, eradicate the language of the people, and Methvin uh, did not do that. But, but the other piece, too, you have to realize that here, he, here his school was in Anadarko, and the tribes, the people would have lived within 15 to 40, 50 miles away. So it was very easy for uh, the kids to be able to go home on the weekend or through the week. There was that, still that close connection. And my understanding that even the tribal leaders, uh, people would come to the schools to check up on the kids, on what, the, what was going on uh, there. And that, that, that's what made J.J. Methvin's Institute 
much different than others. And, and I think, too, for many of the tribes who looked ahead to the future to know uh, down the road how important education would be uh, for their children, <clears throat> knowing that, this, that their lives was changing quickly. And Methvin's uh, attempt to not just be a uh, preacher of the gospel, but to educate uh, Native folks in the area was uh, very, very successful. But from what, what we could read, that he sought to understand the cultures, remember that's plural, because especially for the Kiowas, Comanches, Apaches, today there's about nine, perhaps ten tribes that uh, live in southwest Oklahoma. But those are the primary three that, uh, whose, I think his earliest interactions were with the Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches. David J.J. Methvin's missionary work with the Kiowa, Apache, and Comanche, and, and he was certainly a white you know, missionary. Mm -hmm. uh, but what distinguished, we, we talked a little bit about what distinguished his effectiveness, and I want you to speak specifically, if you can, to the importance of allowing Native Americans to practice their faith in a manner that honored their spiritual heritage. J.J. Uh, Methvin, uh, of course, was a white missionary sent by uh, the, the general church, actually, to his bishop to come and evangelize among the Western tribes, primarily, primarily the Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches, uh, you know, upon removal, even before removal, they were, close, they were close in proximity. And so even today when we talk about Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches, we also talk about, we use the abbreviation KCA, which for us refers to Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches. J.J. Methvin was successful, I believe, and this is based upon uh, people who went to his school, uh, some who are still living, and of course, historical accounts was because of his two things. One was the school he opened up, the school he opened up, which not just uh, did not just preach to, uh, teach the Christian gospel, but it was an actual school, so kids could come and learn uh, what they needed to learn in order to survive in this new uh, society. And many people, many of the elders who are around, would talk about um, how they looked ahead to the future visionary folk and would understand that the world was changing quickly and the education would become very important for their children and grandchildren. And so that became perhaps the impetus for many of the folks to begin their education, some who went much further along. But J.J. Methvin was al also one, I believe, who, um, unlike the, the earliest missionaries, did not force the tribes to give up their language and their customs. And even today there's still many customs, uh, ceremonies that we do the tribes do in that part of the country, and J.J. Methvin was good to uh, affirm that in, in the midst of, uh, in the midst of uh, being a teacher and preacher of the gospel. <clears throat> Another reason for Methvin's success that you alluded to a little bit earlier, David, was the close ties that he established with prominent tribal leaders and families. Uh, can you explain how Methvin leveraged that, the tribal relationships that he built to support his mission? And, and who were some of the prominent families and individuals? J.J. Methvin, he, he, was, I mean, he uh, knew what he was doing in terms of, of his uh, uh, attempts to evangelize and to spread the gospel among the people in the area. And one, one of the things that he did early on, there, there were many prominent families among the Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches. Uh, if I write the Kiowas or Comanches, for sure had societies or different bands. And so while, they're, while they had different bands, they would live in different communities. So there might be seven to 12 bands or, or groups of people who lived. Uh, they were all related in some way, all Kiowa, but each of those communities had a different leader. And that's still true today in, to some respect. And J.J. Methvin was one who, I believe, who had the foresight to go and gain the trust of some of the early leaders, invited them to come to the school to see what he was doing, uh, to come to his camp meetings and so forth. So he, he worked to gain that trust, and he was successful because, uh, well, he had to be. Historians uh, uh, talk about uh, his success and the trust that many had, but also the stories that those who went to his school, uh, the success they, they, uh, that they talk about that he had. And even today for the elders, uh, he may be in the late 70s, 80s, some in the 90s, uh, always have good things to say about J.J. Uh, Methvin. I forget the last part of that question. I was going to get to something. What was that? Can you repeat the last part again? Uh, David, I think the answer, the, <coughs> the, the two parts that we're really trying to uh, ask you about is one is his, the special relationships he developed with, mm -hmm. with leaders in those families or bands that mm -hmm. you're talking about. 
and also how he allowed them to practice their faith mm -hmm. in, in a manner that, that uh, perhaps wasn't consistent with Wesleyan theology, but mm -hmm. with their, you know, their own spiritual faith. Okay. And what was that last part of the question, too? This one was about prominent families. I mean, names of families. Now, can you recall the names of some of the influential families? Okay. Because I thought, did I catch the first part of the question already? Did I answer that already? Yes. Okay. And then he's talking about um, specifically maybe some of the spiritual practices that were allowed to go on with Methvin that maybe weren't allowed to go on. Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, from some of the spiritual practices that were allowed, that J.J. Methvin allowed or, or took time to learn about, uh, to go on uh, were very uh, were and still are very important to the tribes in the area. That might that might be practices such as uh, naming ceremonies. It may be uh, practices, of course, such as um, we call them powwows today. They call them dances back then. But certain dances that were very important to uh, the people. And you know, every even now in the summers, uh, the Kiowas command Chiefs Apache. All the tribes we, we have our gatherings homecomings, festivals, ceremonies, rituals. And Methvin himself, who, uh, who I don't believe, uh, fought those. He, uh, you know, there'd be times, you know, folks could be gone for a month at a time uh, preparing and getting ready for their ceremonies. And Methvin, uh, uh, apparently from what I have read and heard, did not interfere with any of those uh, ceremonies. Uh, I don't know that they ever translated into the church, but he understood the importance of those, acknowledging those ways for that. I think about people like um, the Samant family, who's very well known in southwest Oklahoma, a large family, and they had, there are many of uh, the uh, children there who would have went to J.J. Methvin's uh, school. Uh, the Quetone family, which is another prominent family, they're related to the Samants there, but they would have been also people. Uh, they both had huge families. There may have been as many as eight to twelve children in each of those families that many of those children would have been products of J.J. Methvin Institute. A couple that are still part of our churches today that, that will from time to time talk about that school and the experience that catapulted them into uh, continue, continuing their education down the road. There are many educated uh, people among the Southwestern tribes and education became and still is very, very important to uh, the tribes, not just in the area but across the state. Were there successful missions to the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes? <clears throat> er, uh, uh, early on, upon the uh, removal of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people to Indian Territory, there were many denominations who evangelized among the Cheyenne and Arapaho people. The Cheyenne and Arapaho people were much, when we think about their history, it's very, all of our tribes are complicated, but I think back to the episode of what happened at Sand Creek, the massacre of innocent. Um, uh, women, children, and men uh, uh, by the uh, Methodist uh, uh, preacher John Shivington, uh, and and then and then the, a year later, as the Shiner Rappel were moved to what is now Oklahoma, near uh, near the in the southwestern part of the state near Cheyenne, the same thing happened. The, the black kettle was camped there with the white flag, peaceful flag, and again uh, was come he was attacked by. At that time, George Armstrong Custer. So you can see the huge distrust that the Cheyenne Arapaho people had, not just of Anglo folks, but of any denomination, especially the Methodist Church. So it was always a struggle, although in the 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, we would have had as many as uh, 10 uh, Indian Methodist churches among the Cheyenne Arapaho people. Uh, today we have uh, two. One is in Clinton, one is in El Reno. But that struggle is still there when you visit those churches. Uh, everyone can tell you about the history of Sand Creek and its relationship to the Methodist Church, which is always fascinating to me, given the history, how um, Shiner Alpha people uh, can become, was, are still willing to be a part of the Methodist Church in despite of what we've done. And of course, we've done much to, uh, to try to not make amends. You can never make amends for that, but to help folk understand uh, uh, this different time and age that we do ministry among the Shiner Alpha people. They're also still a very ceremonial people. The Cheyenne Arapaho people still practice the Sundance. That's still a big part of their religion. And I would imagine the majority of the Cheyenne Arapaho people, at least that I know, uh, are part of the Sundance. And for some, uh, although they practice the Sundance, some may be a part of a church someplace, but sometimes it's, sometimes it's either one or the other. It just depends uh, for that. But the Methodist Church is not 
uh, is not always very, very popular even today among the Shiner Arapaho people. <coughs> in, in the previous interview, we had pointed out that the differences in social and cultural between the five tribes are sometimes referred to mm -hmm. the five civilized tribes and the plains tribes. But so, uh, and again, the mission to those two groups, speaking to the plains Indians, <coughs> how effective was the Methodist ministry, uh, mission, do you think, generally overall to the plains tribes? And uh, your thoughts on the strategies that the church used with plains Indians? I think the effectiveness. Uh, early on among the Plains tribes was effective. Uh, even to the point today, we have 12 churches among the Kain, uh, Kiowa, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and of course, some of the other tribes in the area, the Caddo, Delaware, Wichita, who belong to many of those churches, although they might, they have their own tribal churches as well. It was, it was a much bigger struggle in the western part of the state. Again, given the, the, the relationship or lack of relationship that the native people in that area had with the U.S. government. A very difficult, uh, challenging, uh, terrible history really uh, for, for how the uh, government treated the tribes in the western and northern part compared to the eastern, eastern part of the state. You know, the eastern tribes, you know, because of our earliest interaction with the uh, immigrants, uh, that we, you know, we, the eastern tribes are so different from the western tribes in that, that the eastern tribes were stationary. They had lived there years and years and years. You know, the western tribes, northern tribes were nomadic, followed the buffalo for their livelihood, for food, for clothing, for shelter. And so when the immigrants first came to this country, uh, the eastern tribes who accepted them and took on their ways. And so that, that's why today uh, Christianity among the eastern tribes is so much different than it is uh, from the western tribes. Even today, uh, so many uh, hundreds of years later, of how different they are, uh, and, and we still talk about those differences today among our own people, both the Western tribes and Northern tribes and Eastern tribes, and how different uh, life is among us as Native American uh, Christians. Well, the, the, we referred to the Medicine Lodge treaties, you know, earlier. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Could you speak to their, uh, we'll call it removal, but their relocation, which was forced by and, and accompanied by military to, onto reservations in Western Oklahoma? How is that different or similar to the middle of the five tribes? I think the, the, the Medicine Lodge Treaty, which removed the Kiowa, Cheyenne, and Arapaho to, uh, at that time, Indian, ter Indian Territory, now it's the state of Oklahoma, which was similar to the, to the removal of the Eastern tribes, uh, except, except that, uh, of course, you, again, you look at the way of life among the Eastern tribes who were... Uh, much more culturated than the western and northern tribes would have been. Uh, you look at a people, the eastern tribes, many who upon the river would have uh, spoke English and their tribal language. And if you think about the Kiowa, Comanches, and Apaches, most of the people would have still spoke the language. So there was that cultural piece, the language piece, that would have made it difficult in, in all the reading I've done about the removal of the Kiowa, China, Arapaho tribes was, was different in, in, the fact, in the fact that the government very, very seldom uh, did the right thing with the Kiowa, Cheyenne, Arapaho people. They were very, they treated them very bad. It was, it, they treated the Eastern tribes bad enough, but w when you read about the history of, of the broken treaties and how the Kiowa and Cheyenne, Arapaho were treated, was, uh, it's a very difficult uh, story to read. David, are, are all, all Indians truly alike? They seem to be the, <laughs> the philosophy of the, the church <coughs> that tried to evangelize uh, in mission work. In the, in the, with the Plains mm -hmm. tribes, similar to what they did with Bob Civilized tribes, mm -hmm. but that was a disconnect. Was that a, yeah. was that a problem with the, the expectations of results of mm -hmm. uh, they expected more yeah. people, more churches? Yeah. Uh, can, can you share yeah. thoughts on that? Uh, you know, Oklahoma today is home to 39 federally recognized uh, tribes, and each of those with such different culture, uh, the 39 different languages, 39 ways of life, and 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 so to really to be effective in ministry among any of those tribes, you really have to understand their culture, their ways, their language, and how we operate very, very differently, especially between the East and the West. How we do, how we do church, how we do culture, how we do ceremonies. You know, m much, of, much of what we had at one time among the Eastern tribes in terms of ceremonies or culture is gone because the church did such a good job of attempting to assimilate, uh, eradicate language. And so today, uh, churches are playing a very big role in helping us to relearn our languages, teach it to our children. Many of our tribal schools are doing immersion schools 
Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, starting their children out in, in, at an early age to help learn that language. And of course, the Western tribes are doing the same thing. The Northern tribes are doing the same thing, but we're so, we're so different. And even, and even today, when we send pastors out to various areas, um, we, we, some, we, we see even perhaps Choctaws who might be sent to Kiowas. And you really have to do as any missionary would do, is to learn the culture, the ways. If you can, if you're willing to learn the ways, listen. If you're willing to listen, understand who they are, you can be successful. But for those who come in and try to lump everyone together, it doesn't work. It, it uh, usually, usually ends up uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, bad results, if you will. Yeah. <clears throat> forwarding to uh, the statehood, the territorial area and the statehood and the uh, opening, you know, the land runs and, and the, the assimilation of the Native Americans really into this, uh, this uh, torrential mm -hmm. rainfall, if you will, mm -hmm. from wise into the territory. Mm -hmm. what, uh, can you discuss the importance and significance of the creation? You know, you know, they, or let me back up and mention again that they, they created and merged them into the Oklahoma Conference. But uh, what was the significance of the creation of the Burr Indian Mission? 1918 and the Indian Missionary Conference, I think, in 1921. What was its impact on Native American churches and mission work? Were they reemerged out from the Oklahoma Conference and back into the Indian Missionary Conference? Was that important? The you know the creation of the uh, quote unquote the Brewer, Brewer, Brewer Mission Conference, which was during the time frame when uh, the Indian Mission uh, technically ceased to exist, and until it was re, you know reformed later. For, for many people, the churches didn't miss out on much because uh, uh, some folks didn't pay attention to what the churches were doing. Non-Indian folks did not pay attention to what the churches were doing. And so the people continued business as usual, working to, uh, working to continue ministry and to open new churches and to spread the gospel. And of course, that's among uh, all, all the tribes at that point because the Indian mission would have been working across the state. That I think what had its biggest effect was upon the leadership. The Indian Mission always struggled with leadership, and historians such as uh, uh, Homanoli, authors such as Tash Smith, who, whose research talk about the desire of the earliest Native leaders to want to be able to lead their people, now being told by uh, Methodist hierarchy superintendents and others, saying this is how you, this is how you do ministry in order to make it work. And that, that became, uh, that probably what we fought and still fight with, still fight for today in the church is, is for us to have leadership because who, who knows best about how to do ministry among Native people than Native people. David, obviously uh, the, there were issues that weren't working in the merger <coughs> of the Indian Mission Conference and in, in, into the uh, Oklahoma Conference. Uh, what, uh, what factors influenced the decision to reestablish the Indian Missionary Conference? And who were some of the church leaders that enabled this action? I'm trying, I'm, my mind's trying to remember a name here. Um, uh, you know, upon the uh, uh, creation of the Oklahoma Conference and, and, and perhaps the dissolution, we, we call it the dissolution, but, you know, really the conference, I mean, the, the Indian Mission still did its work. And so while technically it wasn't together, it was, it was still together. Uh, Thomas Brewer, I believe is his name, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E -E was, uh, was one, and I'm not sure what his connection was with Oklahoma, but on the church level, he uh, observed, listened to folk, and saw that something wasn't working with uh, this, this uh, lack of organization, if you will, uh, on, on a national level among the, what used to be the Indian Mission. And so he, uh, I believe, went back to the General Conference and said that the Native people need their own conference. And so he and a group of other uh, white advocates uh, advocated for the their recreation of the Indian Mission, which worked uh, for that. Was that individual uh, John Moore that you're thinking about? No, uh, not, not, not that I, not, not, that's the new name, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E I think it's Thomas uh, or George, and I can't remember the first name, which one it is. But because, because for, for a, a period there, it was, it was called the Brewer, Brewer Indian Mission, named after him because of his advocacy for what he had done. And I, and I'm, I, we, uh, you need to check my uh, name. I forget which one it is, George or Thomas. 
Dave, what were <clears throat> the challenges facing the newly created conference? Uh, you know, we think about funding, mission work, recruiting, passion. What, what were some of the challenges that uh, faced uh, the new uh, creation of the new Indian Mission Conference? And I, I, you know, for the, uh, we, we talked about this new Indian Mission Conference, but really it wasn't new. I mean, it, it, continue, it, it continued on. The challenges would have been uh, early on. It just, uh, the, uh, the, the challenge was for the native leaders who, who uh, sought to lead, who sought to create churches uh, from a tribal perspective, and then the interference of the uh, white authorities, if you know, I say authorities, I'm talking about those in the church, who said, this is the way that we do Methodism. Here's how we preach, here's how we teach. And, and so that was the big challenge because that was still foreign uh, to many of our people because the culture was still different. Al although there was still much assimilation, that was probably the biggest challenge was the interference of the authorities of the Methodist Church uh, to say, this is the way you do it and no other way. And so you'll see instances in, uh, Homanoli writes about this in his book, Tash Smith writes about this in his book of how, peop how native leaders would take things under their own control and uh, would do, despite what the authorities said, here's how you do it, they would still find ways to integrate uh, the tribal cultures into the churches with much, much uh, success. Was there membership growth during this period? And, and if so, how much could be contributed to a Native American preacher? Uh, the membership growth in the Indian mission at that time, I think, uh, believe, we believe was stable. Uh, was stable, and of course, uh, uh, Tash Smith writes about this as well in this book, but the success and growth of the Indian mission was due to the native preachers at that particular time. Uh, people who, who uh, these, were, these would have been men who people knew, trusted, related to, and that's what made them successful. They, ab they were able to relate to these, uh, these folks who knew them, who understand their culture, who un understood their ways, and that, that attributed, attributed to much of the growth, which is true today among the Indian Missionary Conference uh, because of the presence of so many Native American pastors and lay pastors who, who lead the church. Well, can, can you identify some of the uh, missionaries that had, did, had the successful mission work uh, in this period uh, following the reformulation of the Indian Mission Conference? This would be in, in the, the uh, <coughs> you know, late uh, latter half of the uh, uh, 1800s. Mm. One, one of the uh, biggest families, Choctaw families, who had a very instrumental role in the uh, in the success of the Indian Mission Church was the Folsom family. I believe as well as Folsom. Wonderful stories. He he, uh, his family would have uh, been persons who had converted to Christianity, Methodism before removal. And so, if you look back to that time period, even today, Folsom's a very big name in the Indian Methodist Church. And Willis Folsom was one of those who. Went to went to great lengths to keep the churches open. Stories stories about him traveling on horseback and foot to go from church to church to check on people uh, during this time period when there were no pastors present to see what's going on. A wonderful story about him uh, in a field near Fort Towson. That would be his route whenever he would he would travel to Choctaw churches, and he would stop in his field for hours and he would pray. And his stories to say today you could walk you could have walked through that field uh, uh, in, in the time period that he was around. And shortly afterward, you could see uh, bare spots, the dirt in this in this field of grass where he would have stopped and been and prayed for hours uh, for the people and for the task that he was given. David, want to uh, fast forward in this period a little more to say the turn of the the, the uh, 20th century in the early 1900s. Uh, <coughs> the, 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 we often attribute the success of the, 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 the Oklahoma or the uh, Indian Missionary Conference at that time to the support they received from the bishops. And who were some of the, uh, or what role did bishops play in, in the 20th century, early, early 20th century, in helping redefine the scope and, and influence of the Indian Mission Conference? And, and can you cite some, some of the uh, bishops that were, were key to those activities? Are we going, can we go to the mid, mid 1900s too? The, the okay. Early 19, mid okay. 1900s. Okay then. My, my understanding of the earliest bishops who would have been appointed to the Indian Mission Conference didn't give the Indian Mission Conference much time. That work would have been under, under the general superintendents, what they called at that particular time, who would have been given more administrative uh, responsibility toward the conference rather than anything else. 
the main uh, the the main piece would have been through legislation through the general conference that folks would have asked for funding. It really wasn't until uh, Bishop um, uh, uh, W. Andrew Smith, who when he first came to the Indian Mission Conference at the time, the Oklahoma Indian Mission, that he, as as my predecessor and others would say, that he was probably the first bishop who really put the Oklahoma Indian Mission on the map. Uh, he, I believe, was from the east, perhaps Pennsylvania, and he began early on a period of itineration, so he would ask, probably not ask, he would make the Indian pastors travel to these uh, other places across the northeast and the north central to go and share the story about what was happening in the Indian Mission. And it's during that time period that we would have had much funds coming in from these local churches to help us support the work of the Indian Mission. And he, of course, was a great advocate for us at the General Conference. He, he, he lived, in a, of course, during a time when bishops had much greater authority than they do today. And while many people tell uh, many stories about the leadership of Andrew Smith, uh, he was beloved among the Indian people in the Oklahoma Indian Mission because of his uh, love for us. I'm not saying he wasn't paternalistic among our people, but he that was often overlooked because he really worked hard uh, to make sure that the conference made it at least to that period in the life of his church. But there are also, there are also bishops uh, who were going named who really uh, fought against um, um, the continuation of the Indian Mission in terms of becoming and annual conference, bishops who um, would not appoint native persons to key positions, including the key position of general superintendent. Today it's known as the conference superintendent. So while Bishop Andrew Smith did great work, uh, those that would come later were not as strong and as uh, easy to work with as uh, life continued for what would later become the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. Would you uh, speak to maybe uh, Paul Melhouse and John Wesley Hart and Dan Solomon? Were they they supportive of the Indian Missionary Conference. Luckily, uh, uh, rephrase, rephrase it so I can get my thoughts again. I'm sorry. <laughs> we were talking about Nancy Smith. <clears throat> Following him was Paul Milhouse and John Wesley Hart and Dan Solomon. Mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, they were supportive of the Indian Missionary Conference. They were they effective in yeah. their support of the conference? The, the 1970s was a tumultuous time for Indian country. Uh, we think about uh, Wounded Knee, we think about the takeover uh, uh, at Alcatraz, we think about the Civil Rights Movement. And so all of that translated, I think, across racial and ethnic people, and it also did for the Indian Mission Conference. And so we were at a time when uh, Native folks wanted uh, more authority, wanted more control of their own destiny, and it was that, at that period that leaders of this conference, who are now gone, began working with, uh, actually at the time, the General Commission on Religion and Race, uh, he's now Bishop, Bishop Woody White, who worked with us, to form the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. And unfortunately, some of our greatest, some of the people who fought against it the most were, uh, was perhaps a bishop at the time, and the leadership of the Oklahoma Annual Conference, who, uh, for whatever reason, enjoyed having uh, Native people as the subjects. And, and so when we think about paternalism, and that was a, a big fight and, uh, for our people, and I have on my predecessor who, who recorded some of those thoughts on video that we still have today and we talked about the struggle that we had and so even, even despite that opposition that the native people uh, went forward and of course began, uh, uh, claimed it right in 1972. Uh, what's always interesting is whenever the late Reverend Thomas Rufface passed away, uh, his, he, when we go to general conference we get hymnals and with the logo and all that stuff and we signed the books and everything and I had his hymnal from 1972, and it had a, had a note, and it said, uh, 1972 General Conference, Oklahoma Indian, Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, it became a conference at the very last hour of the General Conference and signed his name. Because, because even at that time, uh, that uh, the presider of the uh, session and others were working against the Indian Mission to gain that status. And if it wasn't for non-Indian friends of ours, one who would later become Bishop Bruce Blake of this area, to help us with that, uh, it would not have happened at that particular event. And 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 this is, uh, uh, you know, this year in 2016, we will be at the General Conference of Portland, Oregon, which will mark the 40th anniversary of 
the year that the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference finally had voice and vote at that general conference. So I, it's amazing we go back to the place this time around where it all started. <clears throat> and I want to say something about Bishop Solomon too, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, um, Bishop, uh, Bishop Hart was a bishop who was leaving as I came on board, and Bishop Hart was one who was beloved among the people. I see Bishop Hart even today, 96, 97 years of age. He remembers everyone, asks about people. Uh, great memory, and we loved him because he really came and loved the people and worked with us. Uh, bishop Solomon was the one, when he first came, who made some... Uh, monumental appointments, historical appointments in this annual conference. His, his famous quote was, uh, it, it's time for OIMC to claim its own destiny. I use it often in sermons and papers and different books. First up, but Bishop Sol Solomon would have been the very first, would have been the bishop who appointed the very first Native American conference superintendent. He appointed the very first Native American uh, female district superintendent. And that, although those appointments were made in the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, they would have been the first for this whole denomination. So he was one that saw the potential for leadership for our people, advocated for that, pushed, uh, pushed for us, and was a great friend and ally, and who uh, continued. Bishop Blake, of course, who followed Bishop Solomon, who, uh, I guess, again, he played a pivotal role in the Indian Mission uh, becoming an annual conference, advocating, uh, working through the scenes to make those things happen and did a great job of helping this conference to uh, work on our administration and financial piece and did some great uh, work uh, for that that has continued to uh, this day. David, you're, I'm going to use the term uh, empowerment movement, some of the things that you <coughs> mentioned as opposed to uh, reconciliation and repentance. But, but how, did, how did the, uh, you know, this, uh, how did these acts of empowerment how did they, they lead then to the, uh, uh, the movement for uh, reconciliation and, and repentance? I mean, how did, how did they, and how and why did they set the base for that next move? What was important about these empowerment appointments, uh, legislation, okay. and actions of the, the church? Yeah. The, you know, the, the historical appointments that Bishop Sol Solomon, Solomon would have made, the you know, first Native American conference superintendent, uh, first Native American female superintendent were important because it finally gave Native folks authority to uh, be in the roles that we knew we could do. And so, and, th and that's important for the people who follow you, for the people who pay attention to you, who, who long to see Native people in those kinds of positions. And so for our people to understand that the bishop uh, gave, uh, you know, authority and made those appointments was very affirming because it showed us that he, he believed in who we were believed in the talents and gifts that God uh, gives to Native people uh, in, in the life of this church. And so that was a big step forward, but it's also a boost of confidence for morale, uh, for, for us to know that, hey, we, we, while we may still be in the authority of a white bishop, uh, we have li Native leadership who are st who's still able to lead. And as uh, Tom Rufface would say before, uh, who, knows, who knows an Indian better than an Indian? And that was very, very helpful, still is today in the life of this conference as we as we continue in ministry. David, <clears throat> was this an exciting time for Native Americans in the, in the church? Uh, was there hope that finally, after nearly two centuries, flawed mission policies, neglect, and injustices, the Native Americans would be acknowledged and perhaps corrected? The, 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 the uh, are we talking about the creation of the conference, uh, is that, or, or are, you, are you talking? Just the, all the, the legislation, the appointments you're talking about, the okay. Native American Indian Caucus, the General Commission on Native American Ministries, the Native American Conference, plan, all those things mm -hmm. set the base for. Mm -hmm. was, was this an exciting time for yeah. Native Americans in the church? The, the creation of, of uh, so, many, uh, so much work and ministry among Native American people, the, of course what was happening the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, the creation of the Native American International Caucus, which the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference helped to create the na later the Native American plan was very, very important because it helped, it showed us that the church was interested in Native American people, that it, it gave some credence to uh, what made us different, what made us special, what made us stood out, stand out as Native American people, to know that ministry among indigenous people, Native people, is much different in some respects than it is for the dominant culture. And it, so it was, a very, it was an affirming move for us. It was it's never, never to where it should be 
but it was a start and, and it helped, it helped for us to see that while other racial ethnic groups had their place at the table in the church, that finally we had uh, a spot at the table for us as well. So it's very defining uh, for us and continues to be. It's a struggle uh, still today when you look at, uh, when you look at legislation, when you look at uh, uh, financing, when you look at um, those, those pieces, that's still a big challenge but at least we're at a place where we can be a part of the, where we work hard to be a part of the conversations. Dave, you have <clears> the uh, Native, uh, Native American uh, comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit of uh, what, what the plan is, the inception of it, what its intention is, uh, help us understand that a little better? Yeah, the, the Native American comprehensive plan, which I believe began in the 80s, uh, was, uh, was uh, an effort for this group, of, for Native folk from across the country to help um, to help each other in ministry. So that meant, that meant we, we were able to focus on issues such as urban initiatives, of strengthening the local church, creating leadership for our local churches from a Native American perspective. What happens today across the church is that the general boards and agencies will say, still say today, here is how you do it and here's, here's the pattern, here's the model that you have to use. And those patterns and models don't often fit the life of the Native American church. So that's what the comprehensive plan does. It comes in with its programs, whether it's teaching lay speaking schools, whether it's training uh, pastors, whether it's working with new fellowships, urban ministries, that we look at that from, from the perspective of, of Native American people. And so this is what we believe will work from our experience, from our culture, culture from, from how we've able, been able to live that in our lives. And, and the, other, the other piece is that outside of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, there is no other group uh, groupings of uh, churches like you have here in Oklahoma. So that means California might have one or two, uh, Michigan might have 10, uh, Nevada might have one, Arizona might have two, and these are states with large native populations. And so these are little churches out there on their own who don't have, and I call it the luxury of being among other Native American people, and so they, they struggle. And so the comprehensive plan is able to help these churches who might be one or two in the midst of 800 churches uh, to try to work better on being more effective in ministry and in, in among the people. Dave, did, did the, the uh, comprehensive plan also include health issues and addiction problems and poverty of the Native American people? The Native American comprehensive, uh, comprehensive plan, of course, is very comprehensive. And so we, worked with, we, we have worked with issues among health. We have worked with issues such as Native American uh, people and AIDS. Uh, we worked with, of course, education, uh, scholarships. We've even worked with economic development among Native American tribes across the entire country. And so we look at uh, several aspects of our lives. The challenge is that our funding only goes so far and our resources only go so far. And so we have to sometimes focus on what are the most critical issues for us. And it's much like the general church, leadership development, uh, strengthening uh, the local church. <clears throat> David, does, does uh, Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference have a plan? The Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference came up with the plan in the 70s, a comprehensive plan in the 1970s, which we haven't updated in the meantime. Our main, our main mission is to reach Indian persons, uh, uh, to reach Indian persons with, uh, with the saving grace of Jesus Christ. David, what, what is the legacy of Native American Methodism and, and what needs to be done to ensure that the unique and historic contributions of Native Americans to Oklahoma Methodism will continue? Was it, read the first part again, I'm sorry. What is the legacy, if you, if you can summarize, so what is the legacy of the Native American Methodism and what its, uh, you know, its unique and historic contributions to Native Americans? The legacy of Native Americans and Methodism, of course, goes back to our first encounter with the uh, first uh, Christian and Methodist uh, missionaries who sought to bring us the love of Christ uh, through the preaching of the gospel and living of the gospel. And it's a reminder to us of the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ that is available to all, that is meant for all people, including Native, Native American people. So as Native people, it's important for us to know that when we read the gospels, when we read uh, stories, of, uh, the, the stories from the apostles and the life of Christ, to know that this, was a, this is a universal story. It doesn't belong to just any one group, any people, but it belongs to everybody. And for those of us who walk this journey as Christian people, Christian Native American people, we, we believe that's an important story, that we're included in the gospel of Jesus Christ and as we, as we seek to include 
of the people uh, in the gospel as well. Has <coughs> their contributions been unique, and have they enriched the Methodist Church? I think uh, as, as I look at our Indian Methodist churches in Oklahoma and across the country, I'm reminded of the contributions that we make in terms of uh, the richness of culture that we uh, uh, that we offer to through the church and to the world, not just uh, of that, but of our spirituality, of how many of us are able to uh, use the gifts that God's given us, uh, these ceremonies and these ways that are still very valid, uh, ceremonies that connect us with the Creator God and able to use those in the life of the church. So here's another way that we're, we're able to connect with God uh, through Christ. Here's another, another way that helps us to understand the gospel and how it, how it becomes real for us today. And there are you know, many values that Native folk have. The, when, when people ask often about why in the world would Native American people become Christians given what the church has done to you. And I remind people when our people first heard the gospel, it was so similar to Native culture and to our ceremonies and our, and our, our uh, thought process, it was easy. We talk about love, lo loving one another, caring for each other, the importance of community. Native culture teaches that. Native culture teaches the importance of relationship, how important relationships are, not just with our families, but with all of creation. So we read the Gospels, we read the New Testament, and we see that as well. Hospitality, which is very, very, very important to Native American people. Gosh, through the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, you see episodes of the importance of hospitality that, that are there. All of those community relationship, hospitality, which are still very important in the life of the church today and, and, and needs to be. And if, we're, if we could continue to emulate those uh, in, in the local church, whether it's native and non-native, the folks could continue to understand what the church truly is about. Could you add <coughs> a comment about their concept of sacredness of land and, and, and what we'd say today, their environmental uh, you know, treatment of, of the, the lands around them and how they felt about mm -hmm. that? Can you, mm -hmm. can you some information with it. Native American people have always had a close affinity with the land. That's, I mean, this, I mean, it goes back for time, time immemorial with our Native American people. And so, you know, when we think about the removal process, uh, not just to lose your land and your home base, but you also left the home of where your ancestors uh, uh, were, were at, where they laid uh, there. And that's become very, very important, this sacredness, because uh, we think about the creation stories of all that, that created God gave for us to, to care for and for Native people have known that for years because these are the places and sites where we have encountered God uh, in, in many ways and so we, we understand these sacred spots where God comes and interacts with God's people and so those sites are, are still so very uh, present across this entire state from the south to the, uh, to the uh, west to east to the north where these sacred spots are still there because those are sacred spots much like the Hebrew Bible has sacred spots, New Testament, where God comes to encounter the people where certain things have happened throughout our lifetimes where that makes that sacred. And, 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 and that, you know, that being said, Native people have been able to advocate for uh, so many issues in terms of the environment to the land. And we still see that happening across the state and across this country, how the land is desecrated uh, for economic uh, exploitation. Uh, not just in this country, but around around the world, which is one one of the biggest struggles because we understand that this land is ours to care for, not to destroy, and not for profit. And a couple of closing questions I want to ask. <coughs> and they are serious, but they may not sound like. It, but why is the Native American Church still here today? Why mm -hmm. why did it survive? Do we think of the removal, of the Civil War, of the the uh, territorial and, and uh, statehood period? I mean, time and time again, most churches would have been just wiped out, but they, they had a sort of re the resiliency, mm -hmm. ability to, mm -hmm. to rebound, to always continue. What, what do you attribute that to? Yeah. When you look at the history of Native American people, assimilation and the attempts at genocide and, and all that the government and sometimes the church did to our people, it, we, we often wonder how Native American people are still uh, around today, especially in the life of our churches, and our churches are alive today because of the resilience of the people. Who see, uh, who see, uh, who see hope, who see, uh, who see possibilities in the life of a church. That this is where we come and we gather in community. We come to experience God. We come to hear what God has in store for us, and we're sent back out into the world to go and do 
the mission that God gives us. And I travel from uh, almost every Sunday. I'm in a different church across our annual conference or Indian churches, and I see the health and vitality, the desire of people, the, the joy that people have to continue to serve Christ and for themselves. They could not think about what life would be without their Indian Methodist church because that's become a, a, an important place where they could still connect with God in a place that, that, that reminds them, also reminds them of the sacrifice that their ancestors have made, those who came upon the trails of tears, those who came from the north and from the west, all the tribes who were forced to this country. We think about that decision that our grandparents made, our great-great-grandparents made to follow Christ. And so for many of us, we keep that legacy alive because we know it was important for them. Uh, for whatever reason at that time, it becomes, remains important for us today. Maybe my, my closing question would be, can you look at the years you've served as superintendent of the mm. Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference and talk about the things that keep you hope about <coughs> the things that you see that are, that are successful or things that may concern you, but just to mm. kind of share your, your ministry and, and your mission in mm. those years? I've, I've been um, licensed for ministry for over 25 years and been in the conference office for the large majority of those years, and so I've had the ability to be a part of process to see uh, uh, how the conference has progressed. And of course, in the earliest days of ministry, things were difficult. It's, it's always used around finances. And so we look at uh, certainly the pay scale of our pastors who are far below any denomination, I mean, any, any annual conference in this denomination. And so we worked hard to increase that pay so we can attract younger pastors to ministry who can continue to build up the body of Christ and begin a new church. So I see the financial strides that we've made I see the commitment of these small churches, medium-sized churches, for us medium-sized, who work hard to uh, pay the pastor's salary, uh, to pay the apportionments, uh, to keep the church in ministry because they believe in the power of what that church can do through Jesus Christ. And I see for us, because people often ask, how, how in the world can your pastor serve at such a pay scale? If it was not for, the, first of all, the love for Christ and the love for their own Indian people, it would not make it. And, and that's where they're at. And so I see hope for the future for people who want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with their own people and, of course, with other tribes around the state, if not even around the country. And we see a hope in our young people who desperately are looking, searching for a peace and for a place to belong. And while we have a long way to go, the hope that our churches can uh, continue, to, uh, continue to live into the future that we may pass on to another generation the hope and joy uh, 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 the love and grace that Jesus Christ has offered for us all. Hey, what, what are we not covered? I'm, I'm going to give you an opportunity here. Is there some things we need to talk about or you want to lift up that we haven't discussed? I like, I like he's, he's a good preacher because we'll say, and my last point is, and then uh, it, and it, it goes on for a while. And in when they say, and my last point, and if they say, and in closing, you know you're in for another 15 minutes. <laughs> I had to laugh because I, I, I hear that often. We get excited, and it's another 15 minutes. I've just had to harass you. I think you covered. I think you covered most most of it. I, I uh, held back on you know some of the pieces for uh, some of the bishops who who uh, worked hard to fight against us, and and that's still painful for me. All of the bishops and the families are gone uh, from that generation, uh, but I held back just because I didn't. You know, sometimes the truth is too hard for folks to to hear, even Oklahoma, for that. I, I, I would say, uh, perhaps, you know, in, in my position as superintendent, which I've done since 2002. Did you follow Thomas Rufface? Upon the passing of Thomas Rufface, I became conference superintendent under Bishop Blake. And then Bishop Hayes was appointed here in 2004. Is that right? Bishop Blake was, uh, uh, Hayes was appointed here in 2004. And one, one, the, one of the remarkable things and one of the blessings that has happened during his time here has been the way that he has helped the people of the Oklahoma Conference understand us more in the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. That means on the cabinet level, pastors and local churches, laity, uh, the way he, uh, in, 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 in past years you wouldn't often hear bishops talk about both annual conferences, but there's not a single place when Bishop Hayes does not talk about the Oklahoma Conference and the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. He's been a bishop who uh, believes in what we do, has affirmed us, and one of the greatest things that he's done is that, that in terms of our ministry culture 
and, and a life as Native American people, he's affirmed that, and he's really sought to learn more about that, not just to, to, to allow it, but to understand it for himself. And that's been very affirming for us under his leadership, that he's been, he, he's been able to help us in, in that way to continue what Bishop Solomon told us uh, years ago, to claim our own destiny and to help uh, put us on the map and advocate for us, not just in Oklahoma, but on the College of Bishops, Council of Bishops. Uh, he's also serving as the chair of the Native American Plan, uh, which he's done a great job for that. So I would just mention that, just, just the ways that uh, we've worked together. And, and the other piece is that much of our church growth for the past, oh, probably six or seven years has been at the, uh, uh, at the benefit of the Oklahoma, I mean, we, benefited, we have benefited from the Oklahoma annual conference. When churches have closed in, your, in the Oklahoma annual conference, uh, their superintendents will call me and say, David, we have a church near Miami, Oklahoma. Uh, are you interested? And we haven't been able to be in that area in years. And so we were dated that building and have a church there today. I was in Willake, Oklahoma last weekend, a church that closed, a beautiful little church that couldn't make it. And it's a church that we are operating. It's exciting to go and see uh, Sunday morning service and doing things on Sunday night, Wednesday night doing outreach to the community. It has a long ways to go, but those are churches that we have received uh, from the Oklahoma Conference, and so that relationship has been wonderful, and we appreciate the trust and belief that we can, we can uh, continue to do what we're tasked to do. Who was Thomas Ruffface? Thank you. Uh, Reverend Dr. Thomas Ruffface was a member of the Ponca tribe and started out as a pastor as a young boy. Uh, later became director of higher education and ministry for the annual conference and became the leader for OIMC and under Bishop Solomon was appointed, first of all he was appointed assistant to the bishop and then Bishop Solomon changed it to conference superintendent. But he, he would have been the general, the delegate to general conference in 1970 when they had the special called general conference to uh, merge the uh, United Brethren and the Methodist Church and he would have been the one who really led the charge, if you will, on the Oklahoma Indian Mission becoming an annual conference. And tell me again the chronology, sort of, of the history of the Indian Mission Conference, so kind of 1844, and then the Oklahoma okay. Conference, and then that he comes back. And <clears throat> okay. The, um, the Indian Mission would have began shortly, uh, informally, shortly after the Eastern tribes were removed to Indian Territory. In 1844, same year as the General Conference, tribes gathered near Park Hill, Oklahoma, and that would have been the very first, what became the very first annual conference of the Oklahoma Indian Mission. The General Conference approved it, and the work began uh, mostly among uh, Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, uh, some Chickasaws, and uh, Seminoles, but mostly among the four tribes. And then so the work continued among the Eastern tribes, and then in 1907, 1906, 1907, the Oklahoma Conference was formed, and at that time, the Oklahoma Indian Mission sort of became, uh, if you will, at, at best maybe a district within what was the Oklahoma Conference. And there was a period of time, informally from 1918 to about 19, I forget what the year says, that it would have became uh, 22. 19, is it 16 or 18? 18 to 21. From, from, from uh, 1918 to 1921, that, the, that we would have became the Brewer Indian Mission. And then at, after 21, became, uh, the designation, received the designation again as the Oklahoma Indian Mission. And then it was in 1972 that the General Conference uh, approved the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, which is one of three missionary conferences today. And in 1976 would have been the very first general conference where we had both boys and vote. And yeah. explain one more time, what's the difference between being a mission conference and being a missionary Thank conference? you. The, 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 the designation between being a, the Oklahoma Indian Mission was, was uh, for the fact that it was strictly a mission toward uh, evangelizing, working with Native American people. The term Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, which is uh, OIMC, Alaska, and Redbird designates that because, uh, because of, of nuances of our conference it was set, were different. So for instance, for the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, it was because of our language, it was because of our culture, and also economic conditions that those are the three things that set us apart of being a missionary conference. Alaska's designation is because it's so far removed 
from the rest of the church. And Red, Redbird is because their special designation is working among the poor in Appalachia. Apple?